Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise Praise God. 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 Today's sermon, message aujourd'hui, if I have to put a title on today's sermon, si vous mettez un titre à lui-même, the sermon will be called In Spirit and in Truth. La titre est En Esprit et en Vérité. In Spirit and in Truth. En Esprit et en Vérité. Um, while I was in school, of course, pendant que l'école, what we usually do and what we're going to try to do from now on, ça nous t'a essayé de faire, ça nous va essayer de faire de cunier, hein? It's to take notes. C'est de prendre note. I never went to class without taking notes. But jamais la classe on va prendre note. Because the person that takes notes is the person that understood better. Parce que monde qui te prend note là, c'est monde ça qui comprend mieux. So if we can get into that habit of taking notes all the time, et si nous quand on a l'habitude pour nous prendre note tout le temps, we'll see that the word of God will become light. Nous va voir que parole bon Dieu va devenir lumière. Everything and everyone has a purpose in life. Tout monde et toute chose gagne un but dans la vie. The purpose of a pen is to write. But your plume c'est pour écrire. The purpose of a car is to drive. But your machine c'est pour conduire. The purpose of Christians is to praise and worship. But your chrétien c'est pour louer et adorer. So what we're gonna do today? Ça nous va faire aujourd'hui hein? There are four questions that we're going to answer. Il y a quatre questions que nous va essayer de répondre. Four fundamental questions. Quatre questions fondamentales. The first one is, what is praise? What is worship? Premier, c'est qui ça qui louange, qui ça qui adoration? What is the wrong way to praise and worship? Qui mauvais gens que nous capable de louer et adorer? What is the right way to praise and worship? Qui bon gens pour doit louer et adorer? And to conclude, we're going to do a self-analysis of ourselves. Et pour conclure, nous va analyser tête nous de nous-mêmes. It's very important that you take this definition down of praise and worship. Très important que écrit définition ça de louange et adoration. To praise is to express a favorable judgment, to glorify. Pour louer, c'est pour exprimer un jugement favorable, pour glorifier. To worship. Pour adorer. Reverence offered. Offrir une révérence. An act of expressing such reverence. Une action qui démontrait une révérence. Ou respect. So when we look at these two definitions, we understand that praise is a part of worship. It is praise that gets you to a worshiping state. So worship and praise is not what we do in church. Worship and praise is more like a lifestyle. It's a, it's a way of living. Now, to answer, the, to answer the second question, what is the wrong way to, pray, to worship or praise? Throughout the Bible, God has constantly judged those that does not worship Him properly. If you could turn your Bibles to Exodus 34, verse 14, and it says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Tu ne te prosterneras point devant un autre Dieu, car l'Éternel porte le nom de jaloux. Il est un Dieu jaloux. See, a lot of people think that. Un peu de monde pense. That worshiping another god is kind of like having a Buddhist statue in your in your living room. Que adorer un autre Dieu c'est seulement gagner une statue bouddhiste dans salon la caille. But worshiping another god is anything that you put in front of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you put 
your job in front of God, you're worshiping another God. If you put your spouse in front of God, you're worshiping another God. If you put money in front of uh, God, you're worshiping another God. So again, worshiping false gods is what you put in front of God that merits all praise and worship. The second form, we're going to look at four, uh, four unacceptable praises of worship. The, the first one we just looked at is worshiping a false god. That's, the second one that we're going to look at is worshiping the true god in a wrong form. The Exodus 32, verses 7 and 8. And it says, Jehovah spoke unto Moses, Go get thee from thy people, that thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed unto it, and said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. L'Éternel dit à Moïse, va descendre quand ton peuple que tu as fait sortir d'Égypte s'est corrompu. Ils se sont promptement écartés de la voie que je leur avais prescrite. Ils se sont fait une veau en fente et ils se sont prosternés devant lui. Ils lui ont offert des sacrifices. Ils lui ont dit, Israël, voici ton Dieu qui t'a fait sortir du pays d'Égypte. Couple of realities here. They were worshiping the true God, but in a wrong form. Because we, if we look at verse 7, if we look at verse 8, it says, These are thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So they know that there's a God that brought them out of Egypt. But they made a calf, a molten calf, and worshipped it and said that these are the gods that brought me out of Egypt. They got the right God, but the wrong form. You see, what they did, they reduced God Almighty into an image. Which is against the commandment of God. Because in Exodus 20 verse 4, what does it say? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. See, graven image is anything that man makes to represent God. So, if we look at a couple examples, how many have seen The Passion of the Christ? The Passion of the Christ is an engraven image. Man made a movie to show Christ's image. How many, how many has a, a painting of Jesus Christ on their wall? That's an engraven image. Man makes a likeness of God to, to look like him. Again, a graven image is anything that man makes. See, the problem with an engraven image, it reduces the glory of God to an image, to, a, to, to an object. And that's wrong. Even when we're praying to God, do we have an image in our head of how God looks like? Some, 
Some people do. They think that God is an old man with a long beard. You see, it doesn't stop there. A graven image does not begin. The graven image does not begin, begin with a painter's brush or a sculptor's hammer. The graven image... Engraving image begins in the mind. So that's the second wrong form of worship and praise. So we looked at worshiping false gods. We looked at worshiping the true God in a wrong form. Now we're going to look at worshiping in your own manner. In the Bible, there's a story in 2 Samuel 6, verse 1 to 7. I'm not going to read it now, just to uh, save some time. But I'll give you a short synopsis of what the story says. The people of Israel, they would journey from place to place. And when they journey from place to place, they bring what's called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is like a big, huge case. A chest. It has uh, 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 holy uh, 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 objects in there. It has the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments on the tablets. It had Aaron's rod inside also. It also had a pot of manna. And there was a special way that they had to bring it from place to place every time. If we look at Numbers chapter 4, verses 1 to 15, the number one rule in, in, in regards to handling the Ark of the Covenant was not to touch it. There was a special way they had bars to hold it. You could not touch it directly. So, there was a, there was a group of people carrying the Ark of the Covenant to the next destination. And on the road, they, the, they tumbled. They didn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall off. So, so a man by Uzzah held, held the Ark of the Covenant not to fall off. What happened to him? He died. Right then and there. You see, the thing is, he thought in himself that he could do something to, uh, to advance the Ark of the Covenant. He should have left it. He should have left it fall. God said not to touch it. Okay. We have rules in the Bible. We have laws in the Bible. We're not supposed to use our own thinking to find out if there's a better way. If God said don't do it, God said don't do it. Which brings me to a uh, uh, particular subject. I mean, if there's, so there's not supposed to be, you, you can't worship God in your own manner. Many times I'm, uh, we could be in church praying, worshiping God. And people are walking back and forth. This is worshiping in your own manner. So we looked at worshiping false gods. We looked at worshiping the true God in a wrong form. 
We looked at worshiping in your own manner. And now we're going to look at worshiping the true God. In the right manner. But no heart. In Malachi 1. Verses 6 to 10. I pray that you take these notes down. Take the verses down. Because the student's job is probably more important than the preacher. Because the preacher is only human. And we can make mistakes. But the student can catch the mistakes all the time and then help the preacher. So Malachi chapter 6, verse 7, uh, verses 6 to 10. It says that the people of Israel offered defiled food, blind animals, sick animals. They offered it to God. You see, they had the right God. They had the right manner. But they did not have the right heart. When I say heart, they did not offer all they can to God. They did not offer the best that they have to God. And many of us are guilty of this today. See, that, that was not worship. That was hypocrisy. See, they were guilty of giving an illusion, but not the reality. They were guilty of presenting a symbol, but not the heart. So those were the wrong ways to worship God. Let's recap again. Worship of, of false gods is one, one wrong way. That's one number one. Worship of the true God in a wrong form is number two. Worshiping in your own manner is the third one. Now, worshiping the true God in the right manner, but no heart, is the fourth one. Now, we have the wrong way. We now, let's talk about the right way. So, I'm going to give you three uh, dimensions or three aspects that contribute to the right way of worshiping God. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So the first aspect do we love one another? You might say, oh yeah, of course I love my sister, I love my brother. But how do you show your love? We also forget that love, to love one another, is to send forth the gospel. To love one another is to help another person in need. So do we have that aspect in our lives? To love one another is the first, uh, is the first aspect of how to worship and praise the right way. The second aspect is a personal behavior. Aspect, 
Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. It says that we are children of light. That's a personal behavior. We have to act as children of light. The Bible says that God is light. Do you act different when you leave church? Do you act different when you're at work or at school? When people see you, do they say that, ah, this person is a child of God? We are to be children of light everywhere we go. So that's the second aspect of worshiping and praising God. The last and final aspect of worshiping and praising God. It's found in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 15 through 16. It says we are to offer praise and thanks continually. The, the key word is continually. That means all of the time. Do you only do it on Sunday between uh, 12 and 1? This is a part of your life. It's a worshiping life. All three has to be done. Sharing love. Having a personal behavior of light. Continual praise and thanks. If one of them is missing, that's not a worshiping life. So, we're talking about worshiping life. If we don't have a praise and worshiping life, we cannot praise and worship in church. Because if you don't have a praise and worshiping life, the worship service is not really a worship service. The worship service would be more like a TV show. Or a Broadway show. Because we have our best suits on, why not? So it correlates. Your life, it, 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 what you live in your life, it, it, it expresses what it's done in church. So where do we stand? How would you say your life is? Would you say you have a praise and worshiping life? In the beginning of the sermon, I said the title of the sermon was In Spirit and in Truth. That's found in John chapter 4, verses 22. Let's look at it together. In this passage, Jesus was conversing with a Samaritan, which was unheard of. You see, you, you, see, you thought that racism was something that was uh, existed in our time, but it existed back in the days of the Bible days. See, Samaritans were a half-breed. They were a mixture of different people. So, for a Jew, which is a pure Jew, speaking to a Samaritan woman was unheard of. That was the first. Re that, that was one of. The, that was the. There's two basic reasons why it was unheard of. That one was the first one. 
Uh, Samaritans were a mixed race. And the second one was that their religion was different than that of the Jews. See, if you look at verse 22 in John chapter 4, I'll read it to you. Ye worship that ye don't know. She had no knowledge. Well, let me look at the verse. See, the Samaritan had spirit, but she had no truth. They were worshiping without knowing the Bible. If that's possible. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they were teachers of the law. They had truth, but no spirit. They just did things because the Bible told them to do it. So my question to you today, are you a Samaritan or a Pharisee? Or are you a Christian? A Christian has both. A Christian has the spirit and a Christian has the truth. A lot of times we come to church and we forget about the truth. A lot of times we come to church and we forget about the spirit. It's all to be both spirit and in truth. I'm going to end off by giving you a little story that I heard um, from a Bible teacher. There was a birthday party. A birthday party for a little boy. And the parents invited everybody, all their friends everywhere from the north side to the south side. West from east. In celebration of their little boy's birthday. The boy was turning one. So they partying, they partying, they partying up to 12 o'clock in the morning. One of the guests came to the parents. And they said, oh, this is a beautiful party that you have. Where's your son? The parent says, I don't know. Let me, oh, I left them upstairs. They ran upstairs. They, le they left the, uh, the child on the bed. But all the coats from the uh, guests of the party, was on top of the boy. They had a party, but they forgot about the true purpose of the party. That boy died. That happened last year in Chicago. Are we like those parents? Are we celebrating, 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 but forgetting about the purpose? I pray that we shall have spirit and in truth. May God bless you. Amen. 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 So, um, so, chaque deuxième dimanche du mois, on a pensé par nos paroles, pas besoin de dire, on a qu'un monde bien, parce qu'on a parlé de vous-même.